This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the Ledger Nano hardware wallet. Have peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more and use the offer code EB09 at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with one of our recurring guests, which is Vitalik Buterin. Of course, he doesn't need much of an introduction and he's been on the show before in, in December last year. We talked about scalability. No, actually not so much. We talked about proof of stake, Ethereum, and it was a really great episode. And many of you will have heard that Ethereum has just launched their Frontier release, finally. So we, we have Vitalik on and I'm super looking forward to it hugely. So thanks so much for coming on, Vitalik. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be on. Yeah, so actually the Frontier launched. So we're recording this on, on, on Saturday, August 1st. It was just uh, two days ago uh, and, and I was right where I am at this moment and, and you were there as well. It was, it was kind of how did that actually feel for you finally finally reached a step because when, when you guys started the idea was it was going to be like in a few months no the launch yeah i'm definitely relieved because <laughs> you know we've this uh, has been going on for quite a long time now and you know originally we thought we were going to launch back in uh, well originally we thought we were going to launch back in february 2014 and then it get, kept on getting pushed back and back a couple of months and you know, there definitely were times where it seemed like it was just going to keep on going forever. But, you know, finally, it's happened. I guess so. Uh, we've moved past stage two and we're on stage three now. So that's great. So you guys were both there at the Ethereum office. Uh, how did it feel to be there when, uh, when, when it launched and when there was the Genesis block? Yeah, it was great. I mean, we had uh, quite a lot of people, maybe somewhere from a third to a half of the dev team all together in Berlin. We got to celebrate a bit. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's of course hard to know, right? How big of an event this was. Perhaps it was a big event. Perhaps not. You know, history will tell. But it was definitely, yeah. it was definitely nice. You no, know, because having you know, knowing these people well who have worked on this and having seen them work on this for such a long time, and it was always just yeah. like abstract thing. And now it's actually live, right? It's actually here yeah. and running. So I think this is a huge change. I'm sure mm -hmm. it's going to be very motivating for people too now. Yeah, I think so. So let's uh, get started by, by talking about the Frontier launch. So could you explain what is the Frontier launch in, in, in the different steps of, of uh, launching Ethereum? Sure. So the Frontier launch is the first time that there is going to be the live Ethereum network. And, you know, Ether is going to be valuable. Um, there's, uh, you know, people are going to actually be able to develop applications on it. And we'll, they'll, have con they'll have confidence that the that whatever state they, those applications end up happening actually will end up carrying forward. So it's not just a test that that'll get deleted in two or three months. Um, it's a, a kind of very early developer focused launch. So what we've done is we've sort of split up launch into these multiple stages where the first stage is frontier, where we, you know, explicitly say, you know, this is the here be dragons, no safety guaranteed network. It's, uh, it could easily end up having bugs on it it's uh just some, something something for miners to help get the network started and for developers to start building on it you know the only interface is a command line so this is the sort of stage that we'd like to see the ethereum network going for for a couple of months and if it goes for a couple of months without hitches then you know we'll move on to the next stage which which we're calling homestead and I mean, originally the plan was that Frontier would also be sort of quasi-centralized, so the Ethereum Foundation would be like checkpointing blocks every day, but we've uh, decided there are a bunch of reasons why we can't really do that to that extent, so we ended up uh, delaying, uh, delaying Frontier a bit more and pushing it to the point where it's kind of halfway to where we wanted Homestead to be in the first place. So differences between Frontier and home, Homestead that remain are in, to some extent marketing, so it's kind of the difference between alpha and beta. Um, there are still are a few kind of default kill switch features that are in in Frontier. So the main one is this uh, thing that we're calling canaries, which is basically that there are a few contracts on the blockchain. And 
the core developers have the ability to send transactions to these contracts, which basically mark a particular chain as being invalid in some way. So, you know, if say the blockchain forks and we decide that one fork is is valid and the other fork is invalid and it's just happening because one of the clients has a bug in it, then we would launch a transaction which is specifically targeted to the bad chain, which would basically eventually get into the blockchain and basically mark it as be as you know being wrong and and everyone will automatically stop mining on it. So so, so people the clients then will automatically stop mining yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. So that's something that's I mean, it's centralization to some degree. It's there in Frontier. It's a kind of training wheel that's going to come off in, in Homestead. Um, uh, so aside from that, I mean, yeah, Homestead is just going to have, uh, I mean, the software is going to continue to improve, obviously. Um, it's the point where we start recommending that people actually start building, you know, more serious and long-term applications on it instead of, uh, basically just sort of very uh, very early development and testing. Step three is uh, Metropolis. So this is where we release Mist, which is, you know, the Ethereum browser. And Ethereum is finally going to have a GUI. Yay. Um, mm -hmm. If you want, you know, you could actually download and use Mist right now. So, you know, there is a very early, early version of Mist. It works. There is a wallet and a multi-sig wallet in that version of Mist. They work. But there's still sort of very alpha stage and we're not uh, and we're not uh, claiming that they're kind of ready for anything close to mainstream use at this point but you know at some point we're going to sort of formally release mist and yay people will be able to use it is that also um, when the ide comes out the mix ide the mix ide is out already um it's con continuing to evolve over time but it's uh i mean there is a version you can use it okay because uh, there's some confusion around there at least for me uh, it is, is this what, what you're calling now LF0, or is that something different? So Mix is a kind of piece of software that came out of LF0. So LF0 itself you know, is just sort of very simple GUI for the C++ client. And the sort of main direction that the C++ client is going to take is being for development. And Mix is a kind of GUI that's designed for developing contracts. Mist is the thing that came out of Go Ethereum. Okay, and so what other can you tell us about what what other components are being released uh, with the Frontier launch, or what? You know, mm -hmm. So there there's some so other websites one, like Stats, etc. Is that being released right. now? Okay, so Frontier release includes number one the actual blockchain. Um, number two, it include it includes the uh, development tools. Uh, miss, uh, mix uh, number th it, it has two clients uh, so the go client is the one that's kind of the most audited and uh, the, and the most uh, likely to be to be sort of free of serious security issues c++ client is undergoing an audit right now which should become more and more ready over the over the next month or so as the audit progresses the python client is not audited but you know it's there you can theoretically run it it syncs it syncs the blockchain so that's uh, all in place um there's also a few of these sort of statistics pages there is a stats.ethf.com is the one that we're running it's this sort of view of the entire network you can see the world map you can see you know nodes mining on pretty much every continent of the world map except for antarctica but then those darn peg penguins. I heard they like an XT more or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, the then there are a bunch of third party services that are up already. There's uh, I think etherchain.org is uh, already up. It's, so so uh, that's a third party service that's not being run by ethdev. No, it's not being run by ethdev. It's third okay. party, and you know it's a block explorer. It's got all the blocks. It's got the transactions and accounts. It's uh, No. Showing a whole, yeah. So, so I had a question. Uh, why? What are the, what are the the utilities of having different clients? Like, why a Go client and a Python client and a C plus plus client? Um, there are a few reasons behind that. I mean, one point is that it's kind of 
there are kind of political benefits to having multiple clients because it makes it easier to say that this is a system that's controlled by the uh, where the sort of the protocol specification is actually defined by a formal specification first and implementation second. Whereas with a lot of these other crypto protocols, they basically say, you know, while well, the implementation is the spec and if the implementation has a bug in it, well, that's just that's just a fun little feature that's uh, that, that was supposed to be there all along. So that's basically the, you know, by having multiple clients, it kind of makes it harder for one of them to start sort of gel running away from all the others and uh, adding on its own extensions and so forth. So that's, I mean, this whole sort of governance issue is important to a large degree because, you know, we've seen how sort of things are evolving in the Bitcoin ecosystem with um, Gavin and Mike uh, pushing out Bitcoin XT and so forth. So that, so this kind of centralization of the ecosystem by means of one client, it, basically being able to define the spec is one of the things that we're trying to avoid. Another issue is just from, from a security perspective is that, you know, by having all a very, very large suite of tests and by, by seeing that you, we have three separate implementations that implement and, and pass all these tests perfectly, that just makes sure that there's a much lower probability that there are going to be any kind of security issues uh, between these clients. Um, so, you know, basically you can think of one of the clients as being kind of like an automated generator of tests of tests for the other. Now, of course, there are costs with a multiple client approach. So, you know, one of the costs is that there's just a, a, a much larger amount of development effort that's required. So, I mean, opinions inside the team differ to some degree. Um, I mean, even though I was the one that was pushing this multi-client approach much, much harder early on, I, I and mean, right now I do think that we overinvested in that to some degree. But it's, you know, there there are trade-offs between these things. It's uh, definitely still <laughs> an interesting experiment that I'm sure a lot of future software projects will learn from. Cool. So the launch, as far as I know, and I uh, asked you, I think about this yesterday or something, uh, everything went perfectly fine, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Okay, that's right. And, and so one thing that's also notable right about uh, right now in the beginning, it's, it's not actually possible to, to do transactions because, uh, can you explain why that's the case? Uh, yes. Yeah, that was a fun one. And I remember after we launched, there was this really nice article on the, on the Budcoin Reddit, Ethereum launch is incapable of doing transactions, which was just perfect. So, you know, basically what we did was we decided that we were going to set the gas limit in Ethereum start, starting off to 5,000. And 5,000 is only about a quarter of the 21,000 gas that you need to actually send a transaction. So, you know, this would be the equivalent of like Bitcoin having a block size limit of 20 bytes. Um, the uh, idea behind that is to just let the network sort of start off and stabilize first. And then only after the network is stable, people get sort of start bringing and setting transactions in. So at this point, it's looking likely that the sort of thawing process is going to happen in the next uh, few days, maybe even the Sunday or Monday. Um, so the thawing process basically is that we uh, set, we release an update to the client, which basically, uh, and that update basically tells miners to start voting the gas limit upwards. So right now, the way that the gas limit is set in Ethereum is it's basically this voting mechanism where each block has the ability to set a gas limit, which is within about 0.05% of the previous gas limit. And so over time, you know, if you think it's too low, you can sort of push it up. If you think it's too high, you can push it down. So it's a sort of voting mechanism that should target roughly the median of what, the of what all the miners want in the long term. So within that sort of protocol rule, there are, of course, different strategies for how to vote. So the current strategy is to target just the 5,000 limit. The strategy we'll update to is targeting a limit of 3141592, which is the same as we had on Olympic. Then after that, there are other strategies that we're thinking of. So one strategy that I came up with is targeting a particular uncle rate. So uncle is, for those who aren't aware, is this idea in Ethereum that if you mine a block, and the block doesn't make it into the main chain, you can still get included after the fact and still receive most of your reward. So the original idea behind this uncle mechanism was that if uh, 
basically to avoid penalizing miners that are too badly connected because you know with ethereum having a 15 second block time if you are badly connected that is a serious penalty and you know there might be sort of centralization issues with one particular cluster ending up having all the power and so forth so that's something that we wanted to kind of mitigate but the other nice benefit that this uncle read mechanism ends up giving us is it ends up giving us a kind of in-chain reading of uh, basically how well the network's doing. So if the uncle read is 0 0.1, that means that you know 91% of the blocks are making it into the main chain and 9% aren't. If the uncle read is 0 0.4, then that means that 71% of the blocks are making it into the main chain, but 28% aren't. And you know, based off of that, we have an idea of kind of how healthy the network is. And the theory is we may be able to basically use that in order to sort of target the gas limit. So we could say we want a uncle rate that's not higher than 0 0.4. If it's higher than 0 0.4, then start adjusting the, the gas limit down. If it's lower than 0 0.4 and it looks like transactions are starting to fill up, then push the gas limit upward. So, 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 so uh, let me uh, understand this properly. Is the reason that the gas limit is related to this uncle rate because the smaller blocks propagate faster? Yes, exactly. Okay, so then basically if, if you notice, oh, blocks are propagating too slowly, there's a high uncle rate, lots of orphans are happening, you yep. need to decrease the block size. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah, that, exactly. that, that, that's, a, uh, that's a very interesting mechanism. I think also interesting, you know, if you think sort of Bitcoin, right, because uh, similar discussions happen there yeah. a lot and, and it sounds like you guys... Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of uh, the sort of re uh, theoretical research we ended up doing on Olympic has... Uh, has some applicability to the Bitcoin block size debate because uh, what's happened and with Bitcoin, you know, it's having a lot of the same concerns. You know, if the block size gets pushed upward, then propagation time is going to increase, and there are these centralization risks and so forth. Uh, so, you know, in Bitcoin's case, I think currently the block propagation time is somewhere from to, from around like twenty seconds or so to get to the to, to the great majority of the nodes, and if it goes up from a megabyte to eight megabytes, then it'll go up from that to three minutes, and that end, you know, we'll start seeing larger uncle rates. So, it's a lot of uh, kind of the same math. I mean, my intuition is that with the way Bitcoin currently is now, something on the order of uh, eight to twelve megabytes is going to be safe. Anything higher, I mean, you know, if you figure out how to make invertible bloom lookup tables work well, then that might be a way forward, but we'll see. Well, let's come back to this later. We, we actually wanted to ask you about that. But the, the one thing we didn't get to talk so much about the last time we had you on, and it's a topic we wanted to talk about, is the scalability. And, yes. and you've, it's, I think it's the one topic that you've been most interested in, and I guess it's a topic again, yeah, Bitcoin people are interested in as well. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you guys have the advantage that you sort of can go from scratch, really think yeah. through what way to go about it. It's a co it is quite frankly, I think, a complicated topic for uh, mm -hmm. for us who don't spend that much time uh, thinking about the sort of deep technical aspects of it. But you've written a really nice uh, a white paper, which is a fifty page, very comprehensive white paper. So. Mm -hmm. I just want to uh, briefly sort of read out a problem which I think will make sense to anybody. So in the, in the what do you call it, the sort of int the abstract, you write, uh, so all blockchain consensus protocols have an important limitation, and that's that every full participating node in the network has to process every transaction, right? So it's mm -hmm. pr pretty obvious that if that's the case, then well, then we're going to have the sort of discussion we have in Bitcoin now. Well, the only way to scale is to make transactions huge or maybe do some sort of off-chain thing, yeah. uh, make the blocks huge. So what is your, what's your thinking? How should, what is an alternative design yeah. that does scale so, better? I mean, to start off, there are two easy but bad ways of solving the scalability problem. So. The first way is to just say, okay, let's have a thousand blockchains. There's two reasons why that's bad. 
One reason is that interoperability is harder and it becomes harder to send transactions that go have effects between one blockchain and another blockchain. The other much bigger reason is that each one of these blockchains is only going to have a thousandth of the security. The second bad way of fixing scalability is to just say, let's have big, big, big blocks and let's re rely on all the consensus participants had to having big, big, big servers. And that's the solution. So, you know, the first one compromises security. The second one compromises decentralization. And particularly, I think some of the decentralization effects might end up compounding with each other. So, for example, you know, with mining, if we see the block size increase by a factor of a thousand, then we could easily see just about everybody use two or three mining pools and then switch to using one mining pool. So that's going to be a bit problematic. Now, the approach that I'm outlining in that big long paper is basically that instead of uh, trying to have every node process every transaction, you sort of organize transactions into groups that have effects to, to on, sim on sort of the same part of the state. And then you take these big collections of transactions and you send them off to a random sample of validators to verify. So let's say you have 10,000 transactions that affect like this sort of one corner of the map. And you, you might think of that corner of the map as say being all addresses that begin with three, five. And so one of the important properties of this kind of design is that you actually have to sort of think a bit about positioning and you have to kind of think about, well, okay, I have a contract and I want to position this contract sort of close to other contracts that are going to be interacting with it a lot. So, you know, this is sort of general theorem that it's impossible to parallelize arbitrary computation. And therefore, you know, that means that if we want scalability, the abstraction is just going to have to be leaky to some degree. So, you know, the idea is anyways, that you have this big long set of, trans of maybe a thousand, 10,000 transactions with addresses beginning with three, five, and this, this collection gets uh, sent off to this random sample of 135 validators, then that collection has a, what we call a collection header. And it's the collection header basically you know, contains a hash of the collection. It also contains the state root before applying the transactions and the state root applying after the transactions. So the person who creates the collection has to, has to figure out what the, if, what the sort of very fine-grained effect of all those transactions is and just summarize it with a Merkle root. Then once, that, once that's created, the person who creates the collection sends that collection with a bunch of Merkle proofs, with the Merkle roots, with the header, along to these validators. The validators all check that it's valid and they all sign it. Then when you have the signatures, you take the, the collection header and then you add the 135 or signatures to the collection header, and then you put that into the main chain. And the main chain basically follows a principle of, well, if, if two thirds of 135 randomly selected validators say it's correct, then it's correct. So the header chain almost doesn't even know what's happening at the bottom level. And so this is the kind of principle that it's, uh, that it's working on, you know, that you have all of these different groups that are creating these collections, all, you know, hundreds of collections in parallel, the collections all get signed in parallel, then finally the signatures make their way up into the top chain, and the top chain kind of keeps track of the status of these Merkle roots, which are basically summaries of what goes on at the bottom. So, I mean, that's, of course, a, a very a design that seems to make intuitive sense, right? So you have all this stuff, you try to divide it up, give it to some subset, you know, they yeah. process that and then somehow you integrate it back together. Yeah. But the, the, the obvious thing that jumps out here, you mentioned contracts have to be close to each other. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what are the implications of that? So like I okay, come so... with my random wallet. Yeah. So this, uh, to some degree, this depends on what application you're using. So I think with, Ethe with Ethereum particularly, so in some cases, it's not going to matter. So for example, you could imagine Augur existing in sort of one of these subspaces, then, you know, Lazoo is existing in some other subspace, then some uh, stable coin existing in some third subspace and so forth. And if people that use one application tends to just use one application, then it's going to work mostly fine. The problem comes from, well, what if I have some money in, or some more general even, what if there's some contract in say subspace three, five, and it wants to send off a message to something that's in subspace six, eight, then 
basically what's going to happen is that, well, one of two things might happen. There's actually sort of two strategies for handling this. There's the synchronous strategy and the asynchronous strategy. So the synchronous strategy basically says that, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to wait until there is some collection of transactions and that collect that processes simultaneously subspaces three, five, and six, eight. Then once that collection happens, in that collection, everything can happen synchronously. Now, and you know, the theory is eventually that collection is going to happen, the transaction is going to get in, and it's going to have exactly the effect that it's all going to work basically the way it works now. The problem with the synchronous model is that it's going to take a very, very long time until all of these sort of possible pairs of subspaces end up sort of appearing in a collection at the same time. And if you imagine a big long chain of events that are triggered by a transaction that might affect say five or 10 random different subspaces, then it's gonna take a billion years for it to get in. So the asynchronous approach, this is the approach that, uh, I mean, it works equally well. Uh, it works pretty well in, uh, under a kind of slightly modified synchronous model. It's also one of the approaches that Dominique Williams has been working on. Is that it? Basically, you say that if a transaction has an effect that goes into a different subspace, then basically it doesn't have the effect immediately. The transaction just kind of creates a receipt, and a receipt you can think of as being something that just sort of gets Merkle hashed in, and it's kind of registered as saying. Subspace 3.5 created this receipt. Then, half an hour later, the, on subspace 6.8, you would say you create a transaction that kind of pings the contract on the other end. And then what that contract does is it checks, okay, are there any new are there any receipts in subspace 3.5 that are not yet registered as having been sort of used up by subspace 6.8? If, if there are, then that means that there are new receipts and all of these new receipts you sort of started, started making a computation. So the idea is that, you know, sort of uh, every, and then when you do make a computation off of, the, off of these receipts, then the receipts end up uh, sort of in subspace 68, the, re the, uh, the receipt ends up being marked as used and it can't be used anymore. So the idea is a sort of asynchronous two-step process. It's uh, vaguely similar to Peter Todd's tree chains in some sense as well. Um, so, you know, you basically you have a kind of, it's a sort of debit credit system. You have, you know, the, the contract in subspace 3.5 creating an effect, and then later on, this other contract in subspace 6.8 takes advantage of that effect. Let's take a short break so I can take you to Paris. I dropped into La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin, in the heart of Silicon Sentier, home to many startups, including Ledger. And I spoke with Nicolas Baca, Ledger's CTO, about the level of security in their devices. Ledger is based on a smart card chip that is exactly the same smart card chip that you have in banking chips and in passports, in passports today. So that's something that has been validated for the industry for more than 20 years. Today's favorite second factor is the phone. Um, when using a phone, you are transmitting an encrypted version of your transaction to the phone, to the screen, that can be displayed to you and validated to you. So we leverage on two insecure devices, your desktop and your phone, to create a secure validation with Ledger. We believe that hardware wallets are very primitive today. They are just used to confirm transactions and to display some validation, and that's it. Uh, in the future, as Bitcoin protocol moves towards smart contracts to have a lot more use cases, we believe that those devices will evolve into something that I would call consensus devices, uh, which basically will be able to confirm for specific services, specific rules. How easy would it be to hack a ledger? It wouldn't be very easy, to be honest. I think the best would be for you to try physical attacks first, uh, like glitching, like side channel attack. If you want to really attack it, uh, you will need to get a bit more equipped with like a Focus Beam workstation or a scanning, electronic, a scanning electron microscope. So that's going to cost you probably a few millions. Uh, and as well, you are going to be able to decad the chip. So that's going to be a bit risky for you as well. Uh, but... You are free to try, of course, and let us know if you manage to do anything. Ledger is building an infrastructure which will provide the best level of security for the Bitcoin industry. You too can benefit from this technology and get an affordable, secure setup for storing your Bitcoins with the Ledger Nano. So go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EB09 to get 10% off your first order. That offer code is valid until September 30th of 2015. We'd like to thank Ledger for their continued support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Are there some security implications 
because is it received as um, trustworthy as receiving a transaction? So the idea, he, so the implications are, so the thing that you wants to avoid is he wants to avoid a situation where, let's say subspace three five sends something, uh, sends a transaction, the transaction, then that ends up having an effect in subspace six eight. But then, as it turns out, subspace three that that particular block in subspace three five ends up getting reverted for some reason, and then you have an effect without a cause. So there are two ways of avoiding that. One way is this synchronicity approach, where you basically end up saying that if subspace three five ends up getting deleted, then pretty much or reverted, then all of it, all of the sort of children in what I call the dependency cone also get reverted. So the dependency cone is this idea that. You know, you have a uh, basically the block, and then every block that's dependent on the block, every block that's dependent on the block that's dependent on that block, and so forth. And so you can think of you know a change in one subspace as sort of eventually propagating to every other subspace in a kind of butterfly effect. So theoretically, you can calculate the dependency cone, and you can sort of revert the entire cone. The second effect, or the second idea, is that you basically say that. In order for this receipt to be claimed, you have to wait until it gets finalized. So there's some point at which you have this concept of finality, where you know in subspace three five, at some point you agree that this block is never going to get reverted, and at that point, only after that point will you be able to claim this receipt in another subspace. So, look, these receipts, what they basically are, is they're kind of sort of cryptographic documents, basically saying. Here is an event that happened in this one subspace, and then that event might be something like contract three five. Some contract agreed to send ten thousand units of uh, I don't know e dollar to six eight one five four. Then you know later on, if let's say you are user six eight one five four, then what you can do is you can create a transaction that basically say, pointing. Hey guys, over here in subspace three five, I have a receipt addressed to me. So it's a sort of internal protocol mechanism for like keeping track of these sort of cross subspace events that get created. I mean, it, then, it almost reminds a bit as well of the the side chains idea, you know, of, of having these SPV of, yeah. proofs in one chain and then using that in the other chain. Yeah, you I mean you could definitely think of it as being a being a side chain type protocol. Today's magic word is frontier. F R O N T I E R. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of a listener reward. So what are some of the other uh, uh, ways to solve scalability? So there, there, you wrote a, a blog post recently about state tree pruning. Can you explain what yeah, that is? Yeah, so state tree pruning is, uh, I mean, it's not the ultimate solution because, you know, every node still processes every transaction in state tree pruning. But... The idea is that, you know, right now, one of the problems with, with the sort of Merkle tree approach that we took is that, you know, basically Ethereum clients store the state, uh, a full copy of the state after every block at any point in history. So, you know, they store the entire history, they store this, you know, the, the balance of every account, every storage item of every account at every point ever. So... This is, so, so that I mean, also, sorry to cut you off, but that also means like the code of every contract. Yes. Okay. So that's, um, I mean, it's not as bad as it seems because, you know, most of the time from one block to the next block, the state is almost the same and there's not much extra information that has to be stored. But even still, it's inefficient because what it means is that because of the way that the, the Merkle trees are constructed, every time even one storage key is updated, that's another maybe thousand bytes worth of, worth of tree nodes that have to be stored in the hard drive. So the idea with state tree pruning is that, well, if let's say at some point there, there are some nodes that were part of the Merkle tree and then the block, a new block happens and those nodes aren't part of the Merkle tree anymore, then at some point after let's say 5,000 blocks, those, uh, those old Merkle tree nodes just get deleted. So they're not stored anymore. So the idea is that you know, yes, we'll be storing the current state and we'll be storing 5,000 blocks of historical state, but we're not going to be going beyond that. So that has the benefit that, 
you know, it's going to be much more sort of efficient in terms of state size. So it should be able to reduce the state by quite a lot. But on the other hand, it's also a bit, uh, I mean, it does, well, the one issue that it introduces is that clients are not going to be able to revert more than 5,000 blocks. So if you revert more than 5,000 blocks, then basically you're screwed and you have to re-download the whole chain. So this is the sort of one vulnerability that you get as a trade-off, but you know, I think it's an acceptable trade-off in exchange for cutting down storage costs by a factor of 10 to 100. So, you know, without this, on the Olympic test net, we got up to a bit somewhere between 10 to 40 gigabytes of sort of total storage. State tree pruning should be able to lock that down by a factor of quite a lot, uh, you know, more than, definitely more than 10. Um, the one thing about Olympic, though, is that there are a lot of people that were kind of deliberately spamming the network with transactions that tried to sort of take up as much storage as possible. But that's something that is, you know, it's not going to happen on, on Frontier because in Frontier, you know, we specifically economically incentivize being sort of economical with your storage and even clearing storage as much as you can. So, you know, with Frontier, there should be almost as much clearing as there is adding. And so, I mean, so in general, state tree pruning is just this optimization to, to, to save on hard drive space. So, you know, instead of storing 100 gigabytes, you're able to store five gigabytes and that's great. The things that it doesn't solve are, first of all, you know, the cost of processing transactions. It doesn't solve bandwidth issues. It's, uh, and those two things are ultimately going to be what defines these uh, limits of scalability for Ethereum. Okay. And I mean, but any, you know, given the potential that Ethereum has and sort of the long-term, uh, you know, the long-term outlook of, of Ethereum, you know, you want to try to keep that down as much as possible and implement every scalability um, yeah, exactly. solution yeah. possible to, so that it is scalable over the long term. So one of the things that has been talked about and uh, which we can go into and now is that in, you know, in a subsequent release of Ethereum, we'll be moving from proof of work to proof of stake. Yes. Um, so can you talk about that and what is the relationship there with scalability? I don't think proof of stake is a scalability solution. Um, I mean, it can improve things slightly because it reduces, uh, there are ways that you can sort of reduce some of these centralization issues and, and say, make the system work when, say, you know, every node is humming, a full node is humming along at, say, 50 or 100% CPU utilization instead of 10%. But it's ultimately not going to solve it. But the thing that proof of stake will do is it'll allow us to provide much more security much more cheaply. So, you know, there's people that sort of, always keep on saying that, oh, you know, you can't use, you should only use the Bitcoin blockchain because it has a hundred times more hash power that makes it the most secure. Well, with proof of stake, you theoretically have, uh, you know, well, we, can, we can calculate as all being basically the same security margin as Bitcoin and, and, and even faster. So the way that the, these product, the way that our current thinking in terms of proof of stake works is it's a sort of multi-round protocol where every single round people basic or the validators basically make bets on which blocks they think are going to end up being in the final chain. And people have the ability to make these bets at kind of whatever ratio they want, three to one, nine to one, 50 to one, 100 to one. And, you know, the theory is that the, the higher you bet, the, the larger the reward is, but the higher you bet, you know, the much, much more you'll lose if a block ends up not being in the main chain. So the general approach is that, you know, there are multiple sort of candidate blocks, people end up betting, one of them ends up getting more bets than others eventually kind of converges. People bet, three, let's say, three to one for a block. Once, once you see that every other validator bets bet three to one for a block, you bet nine to one for that block. Once you see everyone else betting nine to one, you bet 27 to one and so forth. And eventually, one, two thirds of the people are comfortable betting 10,000 to one. That's when you call the block finalized. So one of the sort of economic arguments that I've made is that-, that, that I, Just jump in. I think that is, a, that is an absolutely fascinating way of arriving at consensus. I have to say that that sounds, that sounds brilliant. Yeah. And so one of the uh, interesting things is that proof of work to some degree is also a betting game because, you know, with proof of work, basically when you mine a block, you are saying, you know, I am making a bet where I agree that if I mine this block and it gets in, then I am going to win 25 Bitcoins. But if I mine a block and it doesn't get in, then I am going to lose some number, let's say 10 or 15 Bitcoins worth of electricity costs. So 
to some degree, you know, when you're actually down, when you're actually ch downloading the longest chain, you actually are literally checking for, you know, which is the chain that, that the majority of people are willing to bet on. So, you know, the advantage of proof of stake here is basically that instead of the sort of amount of money at stake converging linearly, it kind of converges exponentially. Just let me jump in here and ask a, a little bit more about this. So, so if, if, the, if the point at which the block is like chosen and says that's the one and gets in is, is when the ratio is 10,000 to one, I mean, isn't the implication that somebody, if they have a lot of financial power, could essentially just put that money up and, and then so, even get in? The idea isn't that anyone has the ability to bet. The idea is that there are these validators, and you know, these are like validators that put in a whole bunch of money in the proof of stake system, and you need and each of them has the right to vote a particular amount. So theoretically, you know, if you have a lot of money then yes, you could take, you know, you could throw it all in and you could sort of make whatever block you want win, but that's basically equivalent to a 51% attack. So the amount that that would cost is basically, you know, more ether than there, than there would be deposited in the stake system in general, period. Okay, no, no, that makes sense. So I wanted to ask uh, about 51% tax. So it, what does a 51% attack look like in, in Ethereum? In, in proof of work Ethereum or proof of stake Ethereum? Well, let's let both. My proof. I mean, proof of work Ethereum is just like Bitcoin. You know, you just mine your own, go 100 blocks back, mine your own chain, your chain is longer, and bam, you win 100 blocks to get reverted. That's not different at all. In a proof of stake, it's. Uh, so there's two possibilities. I mean, one possibility is a sort of attack before finality, and the other possibility is sort of attack after finality. So before finality, you know, theoretically, it might be possible for you to sort of slightly bribe all of the voters to sort of switch over from one particular block to another. And, you know, you might be able to have some, some amount of influence there. But after, you know, we don't see it, we don't sort of treat that as being too much of a problem because while well, the block is not supposed to be finalized at that point anyway. After finality, what that basically means is that Vol val these uh, validators basically stakes their entire security deposits on that particular block being finalized. So one thing that could happen is if two thirds of the validators end up uh, being uh, end up basically wanting to create a new fork, then they can say, okay, well we're gonna we already voted on that block. We're also gonna vote on this new block. And you know when that happens, that means that all these validators are gonna have to lose their security deposits on the. You know, but you know they'll be able to sort of make two chains, and those two chains will look indistinguishable from each other. And at that point, basically, the system goes into this mode where it kind of uses subjective resolution. So you know, users would individually look at which chain they saw first, and you know, eventually, sort of a consensus would form around one of them. But this is the kind of emergency mode. You know, the cost of it should be basically economically equivalent to you know buying more ASICs than the rest of the Bitcoin network combined, and at that point, basically having power, the power to sort of screw up with it to whatever extent you, whatever extent you want in any case. And so with double spending, uh, so in Ethereum, we have two types of transactions, right? So we have the monetary transaction, of financial nature, and then we have uh, contracts. Uh, what, what is the risk of double spending on a contract? Does that look like I mean, you can um, rerun the contract? The so the idea basically is that you'd be able to revert blocks and when you revert blocks, that means that you know if there was some instance where A happens before B, then in in the new blockchain you created, you might have a situation where B happens before A. So one example of a fifty one percent attack might be is that let's say I register on the Ethereum name registry Vitalik.eth, then you decide, ooh, I want I'm an evil advertiser. I want to I want to have that page for myself, and I want to create create ads about pornography on on that site. Then basically what you do is you uh, say you do a 51% attack where you sort of revert all the blocks at the before the after the point where I registered Vitalik.eth. Then in your own private chain, you would register Vitalik.eth for yourself, and you know in your chain you, you would have you would own that domain and you would be able to point the domain to where to where whatever you want. So you know that's another example would be a lottery. So for example. It, or just gambling in general. So if you're participating in some kind of gambling application and you lost a big bet, you could try to reverse the, uh, a few blocks and sort of retry and see if you, if you win the next time. 
Um, so another example might be a market. So for example, if people are placing orders, then let's say some big event happens and because of that price is suddenly moved by a lot, then you might want to sort of revert the blockchain by a bit and be able to claim all of these sort of historical orders that are up prices that are really much, 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 much higher than they currently should be. So like basically every different application has sort of its own different set of things that you could potentially do if you had the ability to magically reverse the blockchain's time. Okay, but the, I guess the idea is that with proof of stake that will be more expensive. I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, to circle back very briefly at one point there. So you said in the case of a 51% attack, uh, the attackers, so these two thirds of the validators that, that would execute that attack would lose their security deposit. But how is that possible if the chain is forked? Wouldn't then they be able, at least on that fork that they control, to still have that security deposit or to roll back to the um, point where they had it? So actually, uh, so basically this, uh, it depends. So theoretically, they control the chain and they, you know, they can refuse to accept transactions. But I wrote this uh, blog post on uh, censorship a few weeks back where I basically pointed out that, you know, if a, even a, a sort of a monopoly coalition of users controls a particular chain and they want to sort of make, it, make that chain available to everyone, then there are going to be ways to kind of sneak transactions into the chain that ends up having the effect of uh, basically, you know, doing it just about anything. And one of those things could be destroying security deposits. So it's, uh, so, you know, they basically, they theoretically would be able to, but at the cost of like, basically, you know, destroying the functionality of the entire network. And at that point, the value of their security deposits will be knocked down to zero in any case. You're listening to this show in parts, thanks to all the support we get from our great sponsors. We have some some fantastic companies we work with and we're very proud of what they do and of, of their products and the companies we're happy to stand behind. Every week we reach a large audience of, of thousands and thousands of people deeply involved in the Bitcoin cryptocurrency space, people running companies, people having a lot of influence and people who are just enthusiastic about technology, about progress and about the future. So if you're involved in a project or startup and think that reaching our audience could help you, Email show at epicenterbitcoin.com and let's talk. So just very briefly before we move on, you know, besides the main client, right? Some of the things you guys are working on is Whisper and Swarm. Yes. What's their role, particularly in the context of scalability? Are, are those relative, uh, relevant for scalability as well? Um... So, and maybe I mean, just whisper, I mean, they are real, they aren't relevant to the blockchain scalability, but they definitely are relevant to application scalability because applications definitely should be doing a whole bunch of things off the blockchain so that, you know, if you don't need consensus on them. And uh, just for listeners who aren't aware of that, so whisper is the file store, no, whisper is the me a messaging system, a decentralized messaging, and swarm is a file storage system yes. or the other way around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, Okay, so you briefly mentioned before the topic of, of governance, and that's actually something we wanted to talk about. I think it's something that's really important that we, we start covering more because it's a, it's a tricky topic that's sort of under, I think, under discussed. Um, and and we are, we're going to have Gavin and Dresden on soon to talk about this topic as well. So in, in this context, you guys just added a new uh, foundation board. Yes. Uh, can you tell a bit about that and, and what's going to be the role of the foundation board in the sure. development of Ethereum? So I mean, we brought in a, a new executive director, uh, Ming Chan, and also this found the, uh, three new members to the foundation board. So then the foundation board you know, is going to be the board of the foundation, you know, the sort of governing group that sort of ultimately makes, deci makes decisions. Um, they are in the, I'm, I mean, they basically are doing the same sort of things that a board of directors would do in any kind of regular and nonprofit organization. Um, and, uh, I mean, there are also other sort of specific focuses, you know, things like fundraising, things like sort of managing institutional partnerships that are also important. Okay. So, so first of all, when you talk about 
them doing something that any other nonprofit foundation board would do. Well, I mean, I think normally, because we have a sort of a weird tension here now, like a foundation is a, is a centralized institution and then it's running this decentralized protocol. Right. So, uh, I mean, the foundation isn't really running the protocol, so to speak. I mean, right now, you know, it is the one that's developed the software, but it's uh, the... Uh, and, you know, the foundation is going to have sort of a, a lot of, I guess, moral authority over it. But, you know, moral authority is basically all that there is. So, you know, if the foundation ends up acting in some way that's objectionable, then people can create sort of a different thing and call it Ethereum. And, you know, the Ethereum ecosystem will ultimately kind of end up following that. So, and so there's one thing to point out here. Most of the people on the board are not, I mean, apart from yourself, are not from the crypto space. Was that a choice? Right. Uh, yes. Or did that just sort of happen? Yeah, because of the choice. people that, and what, what, why, why did you choose to do that? Um, in part because, just because we wanted to sort of help expand Ethereum beyond just the existing crypto space and try to push hard toward, you know, sort of mainstream institutional adoption. Um, it's, you know, basically just part of this, uh, this whole idea of, expanding you know that i've been caring about quite a lot over the over the past half year is really just expanding beyond the sort of small crowd that that's sort of congregating around things like bitcoin and altcoins and moving it toward you know uh, opportunities to actually sort of help people on a large scale and doing that necessarily involves having sort of input from people that are from these uh more traditional industries yeah, I mean, that does, definitely does make sense. Uh, now, the foundation will have the task of managing the funds that were raised on the crowd sale. And so essentially how it works for people who don't know is that there's a foundation who, who has the funds from the crowd sale and they pay ETH Dev, which is a for-profit company developing the software. Uh, I'm curious, like, what will that look like in the future? Like, how much money is okay, left so, from that crowd sale? And what, okay, what is so the business first of all, model for importantly, ETH this idea of ETH Dev being a for-profit company, I mean... Technically, it's registered as a company, but you know it is a subsidiary of the foundation. So this isn't this isn't like you know myself, Gavin, and Jeff have shares and and we're uh, and and we're sort of contracting with the foundation right now. It's uh, ETH Dev is basically an arm of the foundation. Um, now, in terms of how things are going to go in the future, there definitely are sort of a lot of people inside Ethereum that are heavily interested in doing their own thing. And that could that will entail starting a company. I think we'll see multiple companies. Um, there's, uh, you know, people are interested in going toward applications. Uh, some people are interested in sort of staying and st staying back, staying and working on the core. So, I mean, I think it's not it's going to be impossible to avoid sort of some kind of diaspora effect in that sense. But I think ultimately, you know, which organizations we're involved with might not necessarily matter too much because. You know, we're ultimately all going to be in the same Skype groups. We're all going to be developing the same sort of stuff. And uh, in, in any case, um, and in the long term, like it's uh, one of the ideas was for the foundation to take on sort of a more, I guess, advocacy fo uh, and uh, communication focused role. But I think we're still deciding the extent to which it'll be that and the extent to which the foundation will sort of directly be running and managing development. So then is okay. the idea that ETH Dev continues to be the core developer of the software or, um, or that all these smaller be... companies, spin-off companies then? I think the spin-off companies are going to end up doing it increasingly more over time. Um, I think uh, like a good outcome would be something similar to Linux where 75% you know, of the code is just written by, by companies in the space. Is uh, you know with the foundation right now, you know, in terms of how much money it has left, the foundation's current capital is, I believe, somewhere on the order of one and a half to two million dollars or so, not including the ether. Now, including the ether, of course, there is quite a bit more, and you know, right now nobody knows really what the exact uh, price of ether is. Um, if I check on CoinMarketCap.com for ether coin, that's a uh, that's obviously sort of one of the bellwethers that I guess some people some people are looking at, but it's uh, so I think it's somewhere. It's uh, currently at a, yeah, currently at two eighty. Um, there are like, there are exchanges where you have uh, bid orders already popping up. Some of them are going like somewhere on the order of one to two dollars. So you know, it's uh, 
very hard. I mean, right now it's hard to say. Once this sort of thawing process happens in three or four days and we actually start seeing you know, a large amount of volume, then I guess we'll see just how rich the foundation is. I mean, it could end up sort of surviving for any amount of time between six, um, between six to eight months and something like that. And uh, I mean, if Ethereum really goes up, then, you know, forever. And, but then, but, but then it's important to note that, you know, Ether isn't the only route for the foundation to get funding for continued uh, de development. So, you know, there are just sort of plain old donations and sort of Bitcoin foundation style memberships. You know, there's a lot of possibilities. And that's one of the important points that, you know, the board and the directors are actively working toward. Okay, so that, that's very interesting. Uh, what, one of the things that uh, I was talking with, uh, with Taylor Gehring at some point, and he mentioned uh, the topic of private blockchains, and he mentioned that, uh, that Ethereum was specifically set up to support that. And, and uh, I also saw on, I think Sebastian, you saw it on, on one of the pages, it mentioned basically how you can say an identifier and basically run sort of your own private Ethereum network. What role do you see for that? Do you think that's going to become a frequent usage or, or do you think most? Yeah, I think there's going to be lots of private networks. Um, I, mean, there, I know a lot of groups that are very interested in that concept already. And, and for what applications do you think the, the, these private networks make sense and for what applications do you think people would, would choose the main Ethereum right. network? So I actually have a blog post on this that I'm going to publish in the next couple of days. But the general idea is, I mean, both categories have different advantages. So with private networks, for example, you know, it's sort of easier for, for whoever is creating the application to sort of have control over it, to, to have the ability to quickly update things if they need to reverse transactions and so forth. Um, things are also, much, you can also have much lower latency, faster transaction confirmations. You can also have uh, potentially uh, uh, cheaper transactions, higher scalability and then a higher transaction throughput. Um, now with that particular part of the calculation, I think is gonna change a lot once uh, scalability comes in, but you know, this is the world we live in right now. Public blockchains, they have two benefits. One of them is the no trust aspect. So you can create applications where even you don't have uh, full control. And you know, or even the developer of the application either has no control or partial control. Um, the second uh, thing that's kind of important is a sort of uh, network effects argument. So the idea here is, let's say you take one particular blockchain application, let's say domain name transfer escrow. So the idea here is that you know, there's a, in general, if I have a domain name, I want to sell the domain name to you, then the issue that we would have is that, you know, either it's a standard counterparty risk problem. If I send the money first, then you might not send the domain name. If uh, you send the domain name first, then I might not send the money. And in general, we have entities on the internet that work to sort of to solve this counterparty risk problem that are just escrow providers, but they charge three to 6%. Now, blockchain-based solution is if you have domain names on a blockchain and if you have money on a blockchain, then you can send your domain name into a contract which automatically hands it over to the first person that provides the money. So the trade becomes atomic. It either happens or it doesn't happen. And you know, with that, you can basically cut the escrow cost down to three cents. And that's a really cool application and it's wonderful, but one of uh, the important points is that in order for that application to actually work, you need to have domain names and uh, currency on the same public blockchain or well, on the same blockchain. But, you know, ultimately it's going to be very hard to sort of, I think for people to agree on a sort of private blockchain for everything, because that would just involve so many industries. So I think the public approach is going to win out for that sort of stuff. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think that's going to be very interesting to see how that goes. And I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, sort of interoperability as well, where maybe uh, private blockchains will be interoperable with, with the public blockchain. Completely. Um, I, I wanted to circle a little bit back to this governance topic, especially because it's been such a, you know, because of the block size debate mainly. I'm sure you've been watching that as well. And, you know, before Ethereum, you were deeply involved in, in Bitcoin for a long time. Uh, what are the main takeaways that you've learned from watching the block size debate when it comes to Ethereum? Right. So there's two issues there. 
One of them is a sort of object level issue of, well, you know, well, how do you regulate the block size? And the thing is that, you know, with Bitcoin, it's always been, the choice has always been between sort of one megabyte and eight megabytes, and it hasn't really advanced much beyond that. But, you know, with Ethereum, we've always sort of been not thinking not about numbers, but about mechanisms. So, you know, originally the thought was fixed value, then the thought switched over to uh, this uh, sort of exponential moving average approach. Now I'm switching over to this uh, uncle retargeting approach. And I think that the sort of choosing institutions instead of choosing results in general is a kind of more robust way of, uh, of doing governance. But the sort of meta level concern is that, you know, in right. general, how do these decisions get chosen? Right. So let me just jump in because you guys, uh, you can maybe have those discussions and say, oh, we, we're going to talk about institutions and mechanism, not about end result, because right. you have much more control over that whole discussion. In Bitcoin, sure. nobody has that control. I mean, you can go in there and say, hey, we need to talk about the process, not the result. But that doesn't mean anybody's going to listen to you. And yeah, I agree. I think that, yeah, I mean, Ethereum does, does benefit from from a sort of greater degree of development centralization and sort of just, uh, I guess, moral centralization to some degree. And, and, you know, that does have benefits. And, and do you think that's something that because of exactly that, you would want to maintain in some extent? Um, I think that in the long term, something, you know, that's sort of highly decentralized is necessary. But I think like these are like, this is the kind of phase where uh, having some group of people that sort of ha has a sort of this sort of shelling points of greater moral authority definitely can help sort of move the community forward in one direction. I think, I mean, I think it, it's kind of like the frontier canaries. I think it's a training wheel. It's useful now and it's, it's going to get less and less useful over time. And at some point, you know, it'll switch over to the points where making it as distributed as possible is the correct thing. Yeah, of course, like one of our listeners pointed this out, you could have that built into the Genesis block. You could have the governance model built in. Yeah. Why was that not uh, done for Ethereum? Was that something that was a success at um, some point? It was or? just something that did, we, I mean, for a lot of those things, we just didn't have enough time to think of them and we wanted to just keep Frontier simple. Is that something that could be implemented in the future or is it too late now that it's been released? Um. I mean, something I mean, it could be done. So one of our ideas for 2.0 is basically to have this idea where people can vote on changing the code and even having like a, as much of the code as possible be inside of the virtual machine language. So all the changes could literally be sort of processed just automatically on the consensus level. Okay, cool. Um, so before we come to an end here, we're sort of at the end of the technical discussion. Um, so looking back on the last two years, you know, you've, you've come a long way from writing the white paper to now releasing uh, Ethereum. You know, can you give us sort of an, an idea of what you've been through and if you would have done anything differently, what would that, that have been? Uh, there's a lot of things that I would have done differently. I mean, first of all, I think just the way the project formed was just incredibly non-standard. Like most sort of startup like things tends to be, oh, hey, you know, here are a few of us, we're friends and we have a good idea, let's work together and make it. Whereas Ethereum was, hey, I have a white paper, I'm going to send it to 20 of the uh, people that I just happens to know in the last one or two years. And, you know, the first 20 people to respond back on email or Skype just ended up being co-founders. So that was a sort of approach that's highly non-conventional, ended up having its costs. And I mean, there definitely were sort of moments internally where the thing came uh, it looked like it was coming close close to pulling apart on a couple of uh, instances, but you know ultimately we went we got through. Can can you elaborate um, a little bit? Like, what were some of the instances that that this approach almost made this project fail? Um, there are like a lot of sort of cultural misalignments, um, especially sort of between people that are kind of more like developers and people who are more like not developers. Um, I think that the thing is that in general, you know, just about. It, just about any money, anyone can be can sort of theoretically be a business development person, and uh, there is a, it's whereas you know with developers, it's so you know with coding, it's something where a lot of people just it's obvious that if someone can't do it at all, and if someone can do it, that means they can do it at least decently. So figuring out sort of really how to structure the sort of non non technical side of the team, I think, is important because like 
non-technical people I think are extremely crucial, but you know, the difference between people that can really push push a project for, forward and people that just sort of just sort of hang around is uh, I think a big one. Um, there's, uh, I mean, just on the cultural side, I think all people had all, all these sort of different visions, but I mean, that's inevitable to some degree, but it's uh, something that really sort of needs to be handled well. Um, I mean, there are sort of, on the technical side, I think we sort of ended up doing, t one of the problems that we kept on having over and over again is we kept on having thinking that the project is going to launch in uh, two or three months. And so we ended up sort of tr continuing to try to keep all these sort of clients up in lockstep with each other. And that ended up slowing development down by a lot. And, you know, we ended up uh, trying really, really hard to get consensus between C++, Go, and Python on features that don't even exist anymore. So that was something that, you know, if we had thought carefully on that, we could have easily, I think, cut the development time down by at least three or six months. Um, in terms of just costs, I mean, there were a lot of costs that we had early on that we didn't need to have. You know, these sort of $1.7 million that we spent even before the crowd sale, I think, obviously could have been greatly optimized. Um, I mean, to some, and to some degree, this is all kind of first time major business experience, both for myself and for a lot of other people on the project. But I think that, you know, from, you know, from here, we've learned a lot of lessons and we're, and foundation is going to be quite a bit more, more sort of efficient and focused going forward. Um, in terms of, yeah, I mean, from a technical standpoint, and going back to this multi-client issue, I think, I mean, once again, opinions differ, but the approach that I would have preferred go, is to have maybe stick to two clients and have one client not even bother with networking and just sort of interpret the blockchain at least right up until maybe two months before launch. And only at the sort of two months before launch point actually sort of start bringing the networking up to, into consensus with each other. Um, Proof of work, I think we personally think we should have just stuck with SHA-3 because as cool as the ASIC resistance proof of work algorithm is, it's the, and you know, as much as it's, uh, I think it's nice that we have it now, we, the time that we lost, I don't think was worth it, especially given that proof of work is only going to exist for about a year. So, you know, knowing what I know now, I would have just sort of stuck with SHA-3 for the proof of work and went straight to proof of stake after that. Um... Cool. There are a, I mean, there are a few other protocol changes that were kind of like that as well. But... Yeah, these these are a lot of things. There's another topic we we briefly want to uh, come to. So Ethereum, of course, you guys are using this notion now or this term of a world computer, which which I really like. I think it's a good metaphor, and um, one of the characteristics or features of such a world computer is that it's enormously powerful. No one could assuming everything works well, you know, one could do great positive right, so, things. And, right, and so course, this is a right, yeah. n right now, this is the world smartphone computer. Yeah. In two or three years, when we have scalability, it's going to be the world super. Right. Computer. Right now, it's a very, very shitty sort of world computer that can't do any transactions. But, uh, <laughs> you know, presumably, uh, assuming, you know, it works out, it, will, it can be very powerful, right? And of course, people will presumably do many great things with it, but also, uh, bad things with it. So how do you feel about that? Is that something you worry about? Uh, bad things? Yeah, I mean, people are, it's definitely going to happen. And at this point, we kind of don't really, don't really know what's, go what's going to happen to some degree, just because it's, uh, it, it, it's not even launched yet. We haven't even, honestly, we haven't even seen any activities in the sort of community. Like, I've seen absolutely no, nobody even suggest the idea of, you know, even, I mean, even, even something that's sort of on the, uh, that's sort of borderline controversial, like Silk Road on Ethereum. Like no one's even, even brought that up. And that's, I mean, that's kind of, I think, from a sort of PR standpoint, it's definitely a positive sign. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm more talking also the long term, right? I mean, recently, yeah, in the long term, definitely.
I mean, I think if if you think about it, it's sort of inevitable. Like any, you can't you can't blame the software. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can definitely do harm with C plus plus or Linux or any uh, type of software or operating system, what have you. Um, but there is potential there because it is quite game changing since there is no central point of failure, etc. Like you know, yeah. if we look at this on a more high level, you know, like recently, and this is sort of. Uh, uh, Topical because recently Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, uh, I think Steve Wozniak wrote this open letter um, calling for the ban of autonomous weapons. Is you know in the context of Ethereum is is this something that you can see as potentially in the future you know, powering really really bad technology or harmful technology for humanity? Um, I mean, if Ethereum gets anywhere, that I'm sure it'll end up end up powering really really bad technology just because, you know, things that get really big all are going to always end up having some good and some bad in them. It's, uh, I mean, not to give the sort of horribly cliched standard response, but it's just like the internet in that sense. Um, and, and, and what's your view in, in this context, just on AI in general, like strong AI? Yeah, so is, is this something you think about? Oh, AI is definitely a problem. I mean, to some degree, it's orthogonal to the blockchain issue, just because, you know, here we don't even have sort of anything close to smart AIs yet, but it's, uh, I mean, this sort of idea that at some point when AI becomes slightly more intelligent than humans is going to become really good at optimizing itself and will become even more intelligent, even more and more intelligent become, and become this sort of singularity thing that, you know, depending on whether or not we program it well, is either going to make our lives really, really nice, or it's just going to fill the universe with paper clips and choke everyone. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, defi that's definitely a concern, and I definitely applaud everyone who's uh, working on solving that problem. To what extent that ties together with, the, with blockchain issues, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, because, I mean, the thing is, it's almost a sort of completely different category of stuff, like, the sort of decentralized technologies, they enable all these sort of applications that are unstoppable and that sort of allow people to create these kind of complex patterns of interaction that cannot be prevented. And, you know, yes, there definitely are sort of these patterns of interaction that are going to, going to end up leading to bad things. But ultimately, you know, at the bottom of it all, it's still humans doing things, to, doing things with humans to humans. So it's, to, I mean, to some degree, a bit more mundane in that sense. So where do you see your role in Ethereum going forward? I know you don't plan very far ahead, but is this something that you see you work you see yourself working on for, you know, uh, uh, next mean, months I, or ten years, or are there other areas you're interested I mean, in? Other if the like if the Ethereum ecosystem continue, uh, you know, continues being a, being a sort of viable viable and growing thing, which you know all indications point out that it, uh, that it really is, then. I mean, I'm, defi I'm definitely going to be in the ecosystem for quite a long time. Um, in the ecosystem, in what capacity? I'm not sure yet. I mean, that's still something I have to decide for myself. And uh, are there any other areas, uh, maybe not directly related to you know, decentralized technologies that you're interested in, or the places you'd see yourself going towards? Um, hmm. I mean, cryptography, economics, um, all this sort of, I mean, this whole sort of uh, rationalist community is always sort of inter interesting and worth following. At this point, you know, yeah, I mean, I follow a bunch of different things, but, you know, as I've, as I've said, I don't really plan, plan too far ahead. Okay. Well, uh, this has been a really interesting conversation. Um, I, I want. I want to say that so I installed the the client, and I encourage every, anybody who uh, who who wants to you know get their hands dirty and, and give it a try to go to Ethereum.com and and install Geth. Um, uh, Ethereum.org. I have oh, no sorry. idea who runs Ethereum.com. <laughs> um, <laughs> certainly, someone who's trying to make a lot of money on uh, domain reselling. Uh, and uh, so, one one thing that uh, you'll you need to know is that, you know, when you install the client, you know you have. I did it on Mac. It's 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 quite simple to do, but um, you know you do have to have either Mac or PC or Linux to do it. Uh, and yeah, no free BSD installations yet. What's that? No free BSD installations yet. I think. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and you have to generate the Genesis block. Um, and then you can launch a node and, and start mining, et cetera. And in a few days, hopefully you start writing contracts. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so uh, Vitalik, thanks so much for coming on. And I think it's, it's super exciting that Ethereum's finally launched and uh, hopefully we can revisit uh, the topic in you know a few months, six months or so, uh, when mm -hmm. we'll, we'll actually see some application, see some traction, have some more like proof and, and the testing and in this sort of a real life context of what's possible with this, how it works. Yeah, and, definitely. And really looking forward to following that process. I'm definitely looking forward to it myself. Yeah, absolutely. So we're at the end of our show. So uh, one last thing before we wrap up, actually two last things, but one is that we've started doing this, this uh, contest, which is bribing people for leaving reviews on iTunes. Now uh, we, we do a draw once a week and one person wins uh, a t-shirt. You, regardless what they write, it can be very negative or it can be very, very wonderful and full of praises. Both are, are fully acceptable. So if you want that, please do that and send us an email with show at Epicenter Bitcoin so we can know uh, what the review was. And also one last thing, we're redesigning our website and redoing our website. It's been on our on our plate for a long time and uh, now we finally need, really, really need to do it. And so we're looking for a WordPress developer. So anybody uh, who knows WordPress, who knows how to do HTML, CSS, you know, who likes to use Gulp, uh, all these web technologies uh, should get in touch with us and, um, and hopefully help us uh, build our new website. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. So we put out uh, new episodes of Epicenter of Bitcoin every Monday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes or get it through your podcast app on Android uh, or iOS. And of course, you can also get it on YouTube, watch the videos on youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. And thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next week.